Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started as people continue to come on. Good evening. My name is Jamila McCorder, and I serve ACDA as chair of the Education and Communication National Standing Committee. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome you to this evening's webinar, Looking Forward, Inspiration for Revitalizing Your Elementary Choir. Our presenters tonight are Franklin Willis and Maria Ellis, and you may type questions into the chat during the presentations, but questions will be grouped together and answered at the end of the presentations as time allows. Please keep the chat free of any other comments and only enter questions. If you are watching on Facebook Live, you may also enter questions on the Facebook Live feed. These will be addressed by the presenters after the webinar has concluded and over the next few days as their schedules allow. Speaking of Facebook, I would like to welcome any ACDA collegiate groups who are joining us tonight. I know the MTSU ACDA chapter is hosting a watch party this evening, so I want to be sure to say hello to them and any other collegiate members we have watching across the country. Additionally, there will be a survey on the Zoom meeting at the end of the presentations. Um, this can be completed by everyone, but it is required for those who would like to receive professional development credit for tonight's session. Now get ready to enjoy our first presentation from Franklin Willis. He is the elementary music instructional coach for Metro Nashville Public Schools and a three-time recipient of the CMA Foundation Music Teacher of Excellence Award. I first had the opportunity to work with Franklin when he was an undergraduate student. Um, unfortunately, he was not one of my undergraduate students, but I still kind of feel like he was. Um, he was serving as a state uh, collegiate MENC, which is now CNAFME officer, uh, and I was the state uh, chair that year and a couple of years, and then Franklin and I just continued to, to keep up with one another. Um, so I, I just knew back then that he was going to inspire students and that he was going to inspire his future colleagues. And it has been a joy, Franklin, it has been a joy to see throughout the years the inspiration that you have become. And tonight his session is entitled Be the Light, Cultivating a Safe Space Through Music Selection. So please welcome Franklin Willis. Franklin, it's yours. Wow, thank you for that intro, Doc. Um, I'm so thankful for the opportunity to share. Thank you to ACDA, Sandra, and Trina, and everyone who has pieced this together. And shout out to my co-presenter, Maria A. Ellis, AKA Girl Conductor. So um, tonight, I'm gonna share for a little bit about being the light, cultivating a safe space through music selection. Oftentimes we um, have students who want to sing or maybe we want to create that choir, but how do we do that and how do we find music that will relate to our students and also talk to them and teach them in such a way that they can be the light. So um, here's my workshop overview for tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about being the light, right? We're going to define what is a safe space. Many times we hear that, but what does that look like and what is that in the choir room? I'm going to give you some tips on how to create a safe space in your classroom. We're going to talk about inclusive teaching and how to reach all students through our instruction and through our music selection. Um, then we're going to talk about before we hand out that piece of music, I have some questions I want you to think about and self-reflect on. And I'm going to give you some questions. And then we're going to end by singing. We're going to do some Zoom and Facebook live singing. So that should be interesting and fun. So um, be the light. And let me make sure I am, so I can see my whole screen. There we go. So cultivating a safe space 
starts with you as the instructor, right? We go through our um, philosophy of music education and we understand that, um, why did I become a music teacher? And we, we write these papers and we do all of this, but then when we get into the classroom, I feel like sometimes our why gets pushed to the background. So before you can cultivate a safe space, you have to be able to find out why did you sign up to be a choral teacher? What is your objective in the songs that you're teaching? And then this one has become so big for me. What does success look like for you? Not compared to what another program is doing or what somebody else in the city is doing, but what does success look like for you as a music educator, as a choral director? Really narrowing that down and having a short list will help you function on how to create that safe space in your classroom. Uh oh, I got too fast in my clicking. I wanted you to see that next slide. I don't know what's going on. Before you can cultivate that safe space, there's a song by Layla Hathaway that says, make the mirror your best friend. And in doing that, you're going to self reflect on why you decided to sign up. And before you can do that self reflection, you've got to do some internal searching and say, how do I want students to receive music in my class? How do I want to show up in my space? How can I receive students in an authentic way? So when we talk about safe spaces, before you can cultivate that safe space, you got to have a safe space within you, right? And so Holly and Steiner says, the metaphor of the classroom as a safe space has emerged as a description of classroom climate that allows students to feel secure enough to take risks, honestly express their views, and share and explore their knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors. So within our classroom, if we ultimately are trying to have a safe space, mistakes are accepted, right? Between the teacher and the students. Being able to share who you are through the music, thinking about your end goals and your objectives, that is the piece into creating a safe space, okay? Stay with me. So I'm gonna give you four tips to build a safe space in your elementary music classroom or your choir room. Establish a connection with students. Create a sense of community. Practice what we preach and honor student voice and choice. So when I'm talking about establishing a connection with students, taking time to learn about our students' lived experiences. If um, you think about it, oftentimes we come off as the musical experts. We have the degree, we have the music experience, and we set ourselves on this pedestal with our students. But when you really dig back and you think about students and their musical experiences, they bring that with them into the classroom. Maybe they sung in a church choir. Maybe they sing in a community center. Maybe they're singing at home. Maybe they're singing in the car, right? All of these experiences are valid. So tapping into our students' cultural capital, the things that they do and the, th and the things that they say and who they sing with, all of those are valid in bringing those into the classroom. So these are some easy ways to establish a connection with students. First of all, learning names quickly and correctly especially with our students of color, our Latinx students, our Black students, our names are so important. And not abbreviating our names and not saying, well, what's your nickname? Well, you, mm -mm. learning our students' name because when you know my name, I feel seen, I feel appreciated, and I feel like you know um, who I am. Then developing an interest in their interests, right? So I've been seeing a lot of teachers, they're finally tapping into social media, right? They're tapping into Instagram and TikTok, and they're finding ways to connect with their students. They're bringing that atmosphere into their classroom, the atmosphere of fun, the atmosphere of uh, dance challenges, right, as warm-ups. All of these ideas are cool, and they add credibility, or what I would say street cred, to your teaching share your stories so many times our students don't really know why did we become a music teacher 
why did we sign up for this profession? And giving students the opportunity to hear about our music teachers that shaped us or someone in our community that, that made us say, you know what, I wanna do that. And when they hear those stories, it personalizes everything. So we're not just teaching music just to be teaching it, we're teaching it because we have a goal and we have passion. Then have a sense of humor. Laugh with your students, right? If they're singing and they sound a mess, <laughs> Let them know, like, y'all, we haven't sound like that in a while. Laugh with them. Because when you laugh, guess what? Everything, everybody's able to breathe and everybody is willing to, you know, make risk, take risk, I should say. Attend student events. I'm, I'll never forget being able to go and see my students, even if it's at a uh, football game or if it's some cheerleaders. Um, but when they see you outside of the school setting, they, they give you an extra piece of them, right? And then posting student work, even if it's a, um, in this now we're teaching in this hybrid virtual setting, even if it's posting a clip of the students on the school website, right? Or maybe it's students have completed a reflection piece and they share that. Um, but having them around the classroom. I used to love to take pictures of my students, um, like in the process of learning, and then putting those pictures on the walls in the classroom. Instead of having pictures of all of these composers who they've never seen, don't know, can't relate to, how about having a reflection of who I am in the classroom? And that creates that student ownership. So ultimately, Kids don't learn from people they don't like. If you've never watched the TED Talk by Rita Pearson, where every kid needs a champion, I, I really encourage you to go and watch that, right? The whole idea or notion of don't smile to January, don't smile to December, you can try that. But for me, it was all about how can we grow together? How can I be myself? How can I laugh and enjoy teaching, right? Because ultimately I want you to come into the space and I want you to feel seen, heard and appreciated and even understood. So while you're trying to revitalize your elementary music program, remember this, it's a simple quote, but it will take you so far. You're not trying to be their friend, but you are trying to build likability within you and your program. So when you're creating a sense of community, students like consistency, right? So maybe it's opening or closing circles, right? The opening circle may be you're asking students what went well, what happened today in your classes, and it doesn't have to be a drawn out 20 minute, 30 minute situation, right? Or, or maybe you do a closing circle and we talk about what was your glow and your grow. Your glow is something that you did so well today. Can someone share that? And your grow is something that you would like to do better next time. Give daily compliments or shout outs. If you see a student, even if it's they brought their folder and they have their choir music, shout them out, right? Give them a high five. Have some type of reward system where students know that you are paying attention to the work that they're putting in. Work together to a common shared goal. Maybe it's a popcorn party, right? If after so many days of everybody having great rehearsal technique or good posture, you have a posture check. We have a popcorn party after seven days, right? So it's not just the, we come and we sing and then we got the concert at the end and that's the big, you know, thing. No, what, we, what can we do to celebrate our small wins along the way? Small things teachers can do every day. Use student names often. I've already kind of shared on that, but it's so important to make sure you know students' names. And for our elementary folks, that's tough because sometimes we have 600, 700 kids, 800 kids. So finding some type of way to make sure that you know their names. Establish shared agreements and rules with students. Right. I know we're getting away from rules and more so to agreements where students understand that this is the expectation when you come into the classroom. Right. Because without classroom management, we can't do to all the fun things that we want to do. 
So enforce these rules and agreements consistently. It will definitely help your students understand what you want from them. Then model the behaviors of respect, caring, self-control, and fair decision making. And that goes right into my next point. Practice what we preach. We must model all of these behaviors that we want our students to show. Self-confidence, right? Self-management. We have to show that as educators. Don't just talk about respect, caring, self-control, and fairness, but actually model it for our students, right? I can tell you so many times where as educators, students are in the hallway and we might be in the teacher's lounge or we might be in the front office and we're talking about a student or we're saying something negative. And we think because they're elementary kids, they don't see that or they don't understand that. They do. We must show students that we care. Be mindful how you talk to students, and especially in front of their peers. So if there's a student that's acting up or, or misbehaving or being a distraction, be careful about your approach, right? Because sometimes it's a cry for attention. And when we give that negative attention, that student will thrive on that. And then we have railroaded our entire lesson or our entire concept. Consider students' perspectives. Try to put yourself in your students' shoes to understand their experiences, right? So if you're bringing a piece from um, Italy, you're getting your students to sing in Italian, think about their perspective on how they might, um, you know, learn this, this new language that they've never seen before, right? So build them um, up in the midst of getting them to the goals that we want them to achieve. Um, and then this is the last one, which is so important about building a safe space in your classroom. Honor student voice and choice. Ask for student feedback and actually use it. <laughs> this shows that we value their insight and that their voices are at the center of the work that we do, right? So if you need to come up with some choreography for a piece that you've been working on, Ask the students, what should we do? And actually plan time for them to show, to practice, to create. Some of the times when I do that, I get so many brilliant ideas that I would have never been able to come up with. And then when we actually use their feedback, there's a level of ownership that takes place that you can't create, that you can't fabricate, right? And it comes, it comes over not only in the choreography, but in the singing and then ultimately into the performance. Plan consistent opportunities for student choice. Strong teacher-student relationships bolster students' confidence to share their voices. So once they see that, wait a minute, I can share something and it actually can be used in, in the process of learning. Wait a minute, I can facilitate that as a student, right? So think about it as, we are the teachers in the classroom, but we also are students. We're still learning and every year is gonna be different, right? So those are your four ways that we're gonna talk about incorporating a safe space. So how do we build this safe space with our music selection? In your handout, I have put um, some songs that I have done uh, throughout the years with my elementary choirs um, to, to build not only um, good vocal pedagogy, but also to build that safe space. And so some of the composers, of course, you know, Rollo Dilworth, um, James DeJargens, Ruth Elaine Schramm, um, I got a Moses Hogan piece. So several pieces in there that, that, I've, that are two-part or either unison. So how do we build this safe space? So these are some questions that you must ask yourself. And these are not the end all be all, this is actually a starting point because I only got 35 minutes and I am long winded. So I'm gonna try to get through this. What musical concepts can we teach with this repertoire? So whatever piece of music that you have, what is the musical concepts that you're trying to teach? What are the standards? What will be the objectives, right? So that's that musical concept piece. But then how can we connect the music to the everyday lives of our students? Right. So I'm gonna go back to my Italian piece. We have this Italian piece that we're doing. Right. It's in somebody it's someone else's culture it's someone else's language. But how can you make that relevant to little Franklin? 
right? How are you going to make that exciting? How are you going to make me, um, what's the hook, right? And sometimes we miss that piece. We just like it because it sounds so good and it's in a language and it sounds the harmonies and this and that. But then think about it from a student's perspective. How does that connect to me? How will student voice and choice be honored and valued during the learning process? So it's not just sing this and repeat after me, right? How do we involve them in the learning, in the critiquing, in the evaluating? Maybe it's um, videoing students while we're teaching and learning and we go back and we say, okay, let's look for things that we did well and let's look for things that we can grow on, right? What do we want students to learn by studying this piece of music? Is it social and emotional learning, right? Is it self-confidence? Is it languages? Is it culture? What is it? In my estimation, it just can't be music. If we're talking about revitalizing our elementary music core programs, getting students excited about singing, it has to be more than music. We have to find a way to reach our students right where they are. Okay? So stay with me. If you saw Amanda Gorman speak at the inauguration, wow, it truly blessed me. And, and in her, uh, her speech, she said this, her poem, I should say, for there is always light. If only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. This is Amanda Gordon. And so after I heard that, I just kept hearing, be the light, be the light, be the light. And um, Amanda's work is focused on issues of oppression, feminism, race, and marginalization. Um, the first person to be named the National Youth Poet Laureate and a published author. Um, I think Maria is going to share about her new book, Change Sings. And so back in February, I just kept hearing this, this tune in my head, and I want to teach it to you. So this is a three-part uh, piece that I'm going to share with you, and this is in your notes as well. Um, but this is called Be the Light. And I would start simply by speaking the rhythm. Be the light. Be the light. You and I must work together to be the light. Be the light. Be the light. You and I must work together to be the light. And let's see if we can get it in the key. So it's a gospel tune. Did I click to share my sound? So easy melody line, you could pull out some um, musical, talk about rhythm there, you could talk about uh, the, the melodic line, but teach that to the, your students. And I'm talking this is third, fourth, and fifth grade, OK? So then maybe next week, when they come back, you add voice two. We must work together. You and I can be the light. We must work together. You and I can be the light. So really simple piece. You talk about why must we work together, right? What is the light, right? What is light to you? What does that look like with movement? Show me what light looks like to you in movement. And so you have so many pieces you can go to and go through. Um, and I think I missed this, but actually showing them the poem Amanda of Amanda Gorman reading that poem so that they have the cultural context on why this was created, right? And then talking to them about gospel music, black music, and how it's been shaped and how it's been formed throughout the years to mean good news, right? So then you get into voice three. Shine, oh shine, 
Shine and be the light. Shine, oh shine. Shine and be the light. You can talk about dotted half note. You can talk about um, lifting that soft palate. So, and I'm singing it the octave down. So the kids will be shine, oh shine. So they would be up there talking about melodic flow, melodic line, right? And so once you put all of these together, these are independent lines that all work together. And you're talking about being the light. And so um, I want to really quickly play for you um, this part with the vocals so you can hear the entire thing, how it's supposed to go. Get Let me fast forward for one. Here we go. And so what you have is you have an opportunity, and we're talking about safe space, right? Throughout the year, we're talking about, hey, did you notice what you did? Was that being the light in the music room, right? So you talk about your expectations. We're talking about working together, building a community, shining, using our light, right? Each of us have a light. And so using that as a way to build that camaraderie and that rapport. Um, this is from my publisher, F Flat Books, which is an online music ed publishing company. If you use the code BTL5, you will receive $5 off to, to get that arrangement. Um, I'll drop it in the chat so that everyone has that link. Um, and then I also have that link in, our, in your notes. But if you use BTL5 at checkout, you will get that for $5 off. And with that comes the actual sheet music, the MP3 track with vocals, the MP3 track without vocals, and then some lesson extensions that I've put together so that you can figure out um, how would you like to extend this particular activity. And also it has the piano score as well. So these are important points. Increase product productivity, improve student experience, and make it fun, right? Some of my best experiences with music, they were fun. I was excited about coming to the classroom. And because I know I'm long-winded and I'm coming right up on my time, this is my challenge to you. Embrace, explore, and encourage, right? Embrace change. As students change, as the years change, music education is changing, right? So embrace that change with students and within yourself. Explore, give students the opportunity to explore their feelings, their ideas, their identity in the music classroom. Welcome your students into the space and let them shine, right? The idea that they have to be robots and everybody has to do the same, that is gone, y'all. We have to welcome our children, especially in the music room. And then encourage, encourage new stories, new perspectives, new experiences, and new ideas. So when we embrace, explore, and encourage, we give the possibility to our students to create endlessly to show up authentically as themselves in our space. So when you ask about revitalizing the elementary music core room, it starts with you. That safe space is cultivated by you, by your teaching, by your thoughts, by your music selection, okay? So my name is Franklin Willis. I wanna thank ACDA, I wanna thank Jamila and uh, the whole crew for having me. My website is fwithlessmusic.com. You want to reach out and you can follow me on socials at 
F Willis Music on Instagram and Facebook, and also have a YouTube channel. So I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to share. And I'm going to hand this back over to Doc. I need to remember to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Franklin. That was so inspirational. And uh, once again, uh, in the chat function, if you have any questions, questions will be held until the end after bo both presenters have presented, if you do have any. Um, but Franklin's handout, as uh, you may have seen in the chat, because someone did ask that question, his handout will be up on the uh, website along with the recording of tonight's webinar. And also there is a link in the chat that Sundra put in also. So if you want to look at his handout now, you can also see it through that link that's in the chat also. So thank you once again, Franklin. And our next presenter is Maria Ellis. She is the Community Engagement Manager for the St. Louis Children's Choir and the founding conductor of the Sheldon Concert Hall City of Music All-Star Chorus. She currently teaches at Sumner High School and hosts a weekly radio program entitled Bach and Beyonce. Um, being a native uh, Missourian, um, I left the state before, you know, Maria came on the scene. And so I haven't had the opportunity uh, to, to work with her personally, but I have heard, she knows a lot of the people I know. And so I have heard so many wonderful comments from friends and colleagues about Maria. Uh, and having grown up in the Gravoy Park, Tower Grove South part of St. Louis, um, I'm so appreciative of the wonderful inspiration she is to the young singers in the inner city in St. Louis. So I know I am excited to hear her portion of our webinar tonight, and it's entitled Elementary Choir, The Remix. So Maria, welcome. The mic is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamila, and thank you to ACDA and everybody for joining us on this lovely Thursday night. There is so many things that you could be doing right now, so I appreciate you all jumping on. Uh, I'm going to share my screen um, because if you don't say it, then it doesn't work. So I'm going to share my screen um, and then we'll get ready with the presentation in just one second. Here we go. And here we are, yay. Okay, so my session, my topic is elementary choir, the remix. But I wanna start with a question. When did you fall in love with singing? I can tell you when I fell in love with singing. I had to be about three years old, I think, because I really can't remember life before the age of three. But I know that singing was the one thing that I knew that I was good at. I wasn't athletic, a little bit of a klutz, so I never played sports. Um, I couldn't draw my way out of a paper bag, so I definitely was not created to be a painter or an artist in that sense. But singing was mine. I mean, other people like to sing, but I love to sing. I would clean up the house and I would sing. When I went to church, I would sing. And when I didn't have anything else to do, I would sing. And I remember being in second grade in my music class. And at that time, we were reading the story of Mary Poppins and then we would sing the songs as they would come up um, through the, the guest the little book that we was reading. And I would sing so proud and so loud because I knew as a second grader, that I had a voice and I could sing. But in third grade, ah, oh, everything changed because in third grade, I was able to join choir. And let me tell you something, you couldn't tell me nothing when I was in choir in third grade. Now, we didn't have robes or uniforms, but on Wednesday nights, we stayed after school to have choir and we performed on TV. Now, I don't think there's a soul alive who ever saw this performance because it was on, you know, one of those channels that probably only five people get. So I think, I don't ever remember seeing this performance, but we was on TV and I was excited being eight years old, being on TV. I loved it so much that every year after third grade, I continued with choir. 
even when I got to college and I was studying business, I found my way over to the choir room because I had to be a part of choir. Choir was back then my life. And I guess we can say now and still in 2021 that choir is my life. Now, I'm sure a whole lot of people on this call probably got some stories similar to that of when they fell in love with choir, when you fell in love with singing. And we now have the opportunity that we get to make those memories with our students. We get to be our students' favorite choir teacher. We get to create those moments of excellent concerts and field trips and memories that never, ever, ever leave you. Now, choir for me was going absolutely amazing. I started a brand new elementary choir um, in one of the inner cities of St. Louis. And then that little thing called COVID happened and the world shut us down. So last year we had the two Ds. It was different and it was difficult. <laughs> Last year seemed like it was five years in one. I mean, like a whole lot of stuff happened last year. We as choir directors were becoming respiratory resource, resource people. We was becoming tech specialists. We were becoming mass ex experts. And we were trying to keep all of our programs running safely in this whole pandemic. We were trying to figure out what books should and should not be canceled. What songs should we sing? What songs should we throw away? We want to make sure that we weren't offending nobody. We were trying to make sure that our, our uh, resources were diverse and inclusive. We was practicing self-care. We was trying to maintain numbers. We was trying to keep our choirs running. It was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. But even through all of that, we did it and we're still here, which means choir has to mean something to us. So I took 2020 as a year to remix everything that I knew about teaching choir. So one of the things that I know that you all could remember when you were reflecting on your experiences with choir was why you fell in love with singing. And I guarantee you that those same reasons why you fell in love with singing your students have those same reasons of why they fell in love with singing. So probably like everybody on this call, you probably start your rehearsal with some type of breathing exercise or some type of warm-up song. But this is how I started remixing for my choir. Every rehearsal, I sing for them. I love singing. So every rehearsal, I sing. And I start noticing how tuned in my kids were to my singing. And I would sing all kinds of stuff. Um, I would sing songs from my childhood, and I'll do one for you in a few minutes. I would sing things that were trending. If it was on TikTok or Facebook or Instagram, or if it's something that went viral, I would sing commercials. I would sing songs from Sesame Street and Blues Clues and Dora. I may give it a different vibe, maybe give it a different shape to it, but I was singing. So here's a song that I would sing for them. Um, this is from my childhood. You may know this, but I learned this from my mama when I was a little girl. And it's called Miss Mary Mac. All right. So I'm going to sing it for you. It goes, Miss Mary Mac, 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 all dressed in black, black, black with silver buttons, buttons. But all down her back, back, back. She asked her mother, mother, mother for 50 cents, cents, cents to see the elephants, elephants, elephants jump over the fence. They jump, they jump so high, high, high. They reach the sky, sky, sky. And they never came back, 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 back till the 4th of July, lie, lie. So I was singing that for my kids, right? And, you know, they give you the applause because they make you feel good, like you really know what you're doing as a singer. So I take my applause. And then I start asking questions. Okay, y'all, uh, what color was Miss Mary Mack's dress? 
Um, and if they say, uh, mm, uh, or if it takes too long for them to answer, then I start back over at the beginning. Miss Mary Mac, Mac, Mac. And I go through the whole song again. Then I say, okay, what color was her, was her dress? And I say, okay, her dress was black. Good. All right. What color was the buttons? Uh, uh, her buttons was white. Nope. So then I start back over again. And I keep singing the song for them until they can get all my questions right. But as I'm singing, they are singing with me because they want to make sure that they're getting these answers right. Number one, because they probably want me to stop singing the song, which is fine with me, but I got to get all my questions right. But number two, they want to sing along with me. So I started including me coming to the stage to sing for them every week. Um, I also, now I do this with my elementary choirs and my high school choirs because as as Dr. Jamila um, said earlier, I teach high school now, school now. So my high school choirs, my middle school choirs, I sing for everybody. And sometimes when I'm singing, my voice does not do all the things I want it to do. Sometimes it makes some cracking sounds that, you know, we could deem as being embarrassing or whatnot. I really don't care um, if my voice cracks in front of them. But I do that because I want them to be comfortable singing with me. I want to build relationships with them. Now, I promise you all that me and Franklin did not talk to each other before our presentations. Um, and so I, I apologize that that we, some of this stuff is going to be similar. But Franklin and I did not talk. He just was all in my presentation, Franklin. <laughs> So I sing for them and I do that as one way of building relationships because I want to get to know them and I want them to know me. Relationships are so, 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 so important, especially as we return to singing. So you got to remember for a few of our students, if they've been virtual, some of them logged in. Yeah, I know that some of them logged in. Some of them didn't log in. And if you didn't log in, then you really haven't been singing for what, 18 months or so until we just got back in, in school this year. So that means somebody who was in third grade, may have been singing in choir in third grade, didn't sing at all fourth grade, and now come back in fifth grade and singing again. And if it's boys, then you were a soprano alto in third grade, fourth grade, you didn't sing at all. And now fifth grade, your voice is starting to change. And you may not be as comfortable with your voice as you was, you know, when you were singing soprano or alto. So building those relationships. I do this um, a few different ways. One way I do it is I ask them what type of music do they like to listen to? And I do that via my tell me something good um, example. And if you've seen me present a or so before, you've probably seen me do it. But we may have some newbies who this is their first time watching me. So I'll do it. Simply goes. Tell me something good. Clap. Now, this tell me something good, they have to tell me their name. They have to tell me something good. And most sometimes I get, well, nothing's good. And I have to remind them that you're still breathing. So that's good. And then they also have to tell me what's their favorite song. And I just write down and take notes about what their favorite song is. I also go around the room and make sure that everybody knows everybody's name in the class so Franklin may go first and then we may have Sandra and then we have Jamila and then then the next person may be Maria so after Maria does her things I may go back and I may point to Franklin and I may say okay everybody now who is this and they'll say well that's Franklin I said now who is this and that's Sandra and who is this that's Jamila. And we do that until we get around the whole room. I'm doing that for a few different ways, do a few different reasons. Number one, so I can make sure I can pronounce their names correctly. As Franklin talked about, pronouncing names correctly is so, so, so important. Uh, my name is Maria. It is not Mariah. It is not Marie. It's Maria. And if you call me Mariah or Marie, I will not answer you unless you're my grandmother because she's like 85 plus. And I'm just not correcting somebody that's 85. So, but other than her, my name is Maria and I want to be called by Maria, right? So I do that so I can go around and get everybody's name. And then so the classmates, they all know each other. Even if you're not friends, you should at least know each other's name, especially if y'all gonna sing together, right? So we do that. 
Um, and I make notes of what their favorite songs are. And maybe I use these songs in a warm up. Um, if it's clean, I may use it in a warm up. Um, I remember um, Meg Thee Stallion had a song out called Body Yaddy Yaddy. And I turned that into a warm up for my high school group. Now, I wouldn't necessarily do the Body Yaddy Yaddy song with my elementary kids. But if something was trending, like Into the Thick of It, Into the Thick of It, well, Into the Thick of It became one of my warm ups for my elementary singers because it was something that was trending. So finding those songs that they love and using that, also allowing them to use to create a playlist. Now I got this from my friend, Professor Cody Raven Morris about allowing students to create a playlist. So as long as the song is clean, they can write it down and I'll add it to our playlist and I'll play that either when they're coming into class before class starts or when they're leaving class, I'll play it for them at that time. And that kind of gives them a sense of pride that you actually listen to them and you included one of their songs into the, um, into the classroom. Again, as long as it's clean, so I don't play anything up front, I have to go home and listen to it first, filter it, and make sure it's clean before I add that. Um, I also need them to trust me. And I need them to trust that I am only here to enhance what you can already do. So if all you got right now is one note, then it's my job to enhance that one note to two notes and build upon those notes. Um, if a student doesn't want to share their voice out loud, I don't necessarily push them to share it out loud, but I do want to hear them singing. So I know this is an elementary session, but I want to tell you what I recently did with my high school group. My high school group, um, the students at Sumner High School are part of the oldest Black high school west of the Mississippi River. And these, these students come from a legacy of rich singing. So Tina Turner and Chuck Berry and uh, Bobby McFerrin and um, Grace Brumbry all graduated from this school, right? Which is awesome. But in the last 20 years, they have not had a choral program. And since they have not had a choral program, there is no culture for singing. And since there is no culture for singing, um, they don't sing. I don't have a feeder program coming in where they sing. So when I was trying to place voices, I was getting very little sound out of the students. So I said, okay, I can't sing like this. So I got to figure out something different. So what I did is I double masked and I walked around and listened to them sing. I said, okay, well, you sing nice here and you got you sing nice here. So let me move you to these different sections. And that's how I got to hear them sing. And eventually over time, because I kept singing with them, um, I can report that as of last week, they were singing three-part harmony. Now you may say, Maria, that's not a big deal, but I celebrated them singing three-part harmony as though they had just won a Grammy and we was walking on stage in our uh, elegant gowns and tuxedos. I made it the biggest deal in the world because I was so, so proud of them. And because I did that, once they, once they found that they knew how to lock these chords, then they weren't as afraid to sing, building relationships, coming up with those ways that we can win together. Now, as I told you earlier, I sing in front of them all the time. My voice cracks. My voice does all kinds of stuff when I'm singing with them. And I don't intentionally try to crack, but y'all know, some days your voice works and sometimes it'd be like, you know what, you're on your own today. And we just have to deal with that. So when it does, I just laugh. And I said, look, y'all, I know that I got all these degrees and all that kind of stuff. My voice don't care nothing about that. So if I'm not taking care of my voice, it's not going to perform like I need it to. And so I start teaching them about their vocal health and things like that. And I do this in elementary, but teach them vocal health and all these things because I want them to be able to sing for a long time, right? If they crack, we celebrate the crack. You crack, you know what you was trying. And this is rehearsal and you are supposed to mess up big in rehearsal. Mess up big. If it's wrong and you sing it wrong, that's okay. We are here to rehearse. We are learning together. Just don't mess up on stage. So get all your mess ups out here. That way when we get on stage, you'll be a okay. <laughs> so 
what are we singing this semester? So Franklin gave us a lot of songs, which some of these I included in my presentation, but I removed them once I found out that he, re he was using them. So Franklin gave you all a list um, and I'm gonna give you some that I love to sing. I always choose rep that's fun. Um, I try to find stuff because y'all yeah, know choosing rep can be fun and it can be a little bit stressful because if you're anything like me, you wanna make sure that you are choosing the right pieces for your singers. And I want my singers to be well-rounded. So I'll, we sing a little bit of everything. First thing I do, I'm always going to play to my strengths. I am a gospel choir director. I've been directing gospel choirs since I was 12 years old. I've been singing gospel music probably since I was three or maybe even before that. So I'm always going to program a gospel piece and I'm going to teach them everything I know so they can be authentic in these gospel pieces. Um, I love gospel music. So some of my favorite gospel pieces for elementary are Going Up Yonder by Walter Hawkins, um, Oh Happy Day by Edwin Hawkins. Those are two of my favorite, favorite, favorite pieces for elementary and feel good, which I'll get to later. The only thing I said, if you choose to perform a piece that's not something that you're not, maybe you're not in that culture or maybe you don't have that background for that piece. All I say is listen to the original first, no matter where you buy the score from, go back and listen to the original song, not necessarily the song that the publisher put on the website, because that may not be the original. Um, you want to sound as authentic as possible. So listen to several recordings of several choirs doing these pieces. Um, and if you need assistance, just re especially if it's gospel, reach out to me. I'm more than happy to help you, okay? I always also try to find something that has like some cute dance moves or something that makes the crowd smile or, you know, some of those moments where the parents can be like, that's my baby on stage. I'm all for that that's my baby. I want those moments. I want those moments. So I find songs that, that give me those little cutesy elementary moments. Um, Animal Imagination is one of my favorite songs. I love Animal uh, Imagination. So if I can program that, if I could program it every year, I would, but I just love songs that, that there's movement to it and that they can have fun on stage. Um, here are some other songs that I like. Oh, here we go. But let me, let, me do my, let me do my other songs first. Let me go to this one. Um, Child of Peace. Um, and on my handout, there's links to where you can get all these. Child of Peace, I love that because it gives the students the opportunity to sing in six different languages. Uh, Come and Trip It. Uh, that's my handle. I love Come and Trip It because there's a line that goes, um, on the light fantastic tall, oh, oh. And so I'll use that little, oh, I use that in my warm-ups for them. And I may, I may take it out of context and we may slow it down. Um, oh, oh, that may be what I sing to them today, for the, sing to them for that day. And I may ask them, what style of music am I singing that in? Or maybe sometimes I'll go real classical and real operatic and sing it for them in that way. We just have fun singing music, okay? Another thing that I do um, that I love is Be Stupid Mirror. I sang that when I was in elementary, uh, when I was in sixth grade, and I just absolutely love it. Or trying to find pieces that come from movies. So Pure Imagination, which comes from uh, Willy Wonka, or now, I guess nowadays, Charlie, Charlie, and, the Charlie, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> you know, finding those songs. So play to your strengths, know your singers. Don't choose the popular pieces if your singers are not ready. That doesn't help anybody. So choose the ones that they can be successful in because what we don't want to do is choose something that's super hard or just choosing something for the sake of, you know, I got to program uh, a black composer. I got to program a female composer. I got to program a Latinx. So I got to program this or, pro or program that. If your kids aren't ready for that particular composer, find a piece from somebody else that works. Um, also ask your students, you may have student composers. I had a girl in one of my choirs, I used to teach, um, these little after school choirs as part of being community engagement for the children's choir. And this particular girl, she, um, she wrote a song 
And the kids in the choir was so happy. And I was like, okay, well, sing the song for me. So they sang the song and I was like, okay. I said, well, young composer, we're going to put this on our concert. So my companies and I put some, uh, well, my companies, rather. my companies put some music behind what she wrote. And um, I kind of helped arrange it. And then we did it in our concert. And then I framed her music and gave it to her. And I said, and from here on out, you identify yourself as a composer. And she was like, oh my God, am I a composer? I was like, 100%, ma'am, you're a composer. Think how I just changed her world. You know what I mean? So if they if they have pieces, put that on your concert. What can it hurt? Can't hurt anything. Um, involve your community. If you can do something and hook up with the math teacher or the science teacher or something like that, add those, involve them into your concerts. Um, I wrote a song for my kids math teacher um it was called the prime number song and they learned their prime numbers based on a song that i wrote um uh, based on the lizzo tune um i don't remember the name of the lizzo song but anyway I wrote a song based on that so involve your community in there or have your parents sing there's a song i think it's called um sing with me but it goes la 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 and then the parents sing la 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 and it's just a beautiful time of them sharing together. All right, I got to wrap it up. I only got a few more minutes. Here's my, in, in, my inspirational moment for you. Look, the last few years have, the, the last year or so, it's been hard on everybody, but we are created to do this. Every time our students sing, we rekindle that passion for singing just like somebody did for us when we were um, younger. And even though this year may have a different look, everything can be changed and we it's our time now to mold it into what we want to be you don't have to be stuck in this box remix it when it comes to this basic stuff like soul fetch well i taught my kids the regular soul fetch hand signs and they couldn't re they couldn't remember it so i remixed it and we did a whole dance music video about it which i'll put into the chat in a few minutes but we did a whole video about it and now they're excited about singing their soul fetch, remix it, change it, whatever you can think of, put it out there. The only person that's, that's there to judge you is you and your students, right? So put it out there, think outside the box. Um, find the needs that may be happening in your choir. I had some students who um, were having some reading issues um, my, in my elementary choir. So what I do, I started reading every rehearsal. And instead of just reading the books, I would sing them. So um, maybe one day I sang in a country voice. Maybe one day I gave it like, again, my operatic voice, or maybe I did it in my um, gospel voice, or maybe I wrapped the book, but just adding those things where they feel like they are a part of it. And then by the time we got to the end of the rehearsals in the, in the following weeks, they wanted to read. They wanted to get up and, and perform the book and things like that. So finding those ways that you can still, as Franklin told us, be the light, not only to the students, but to, to everybody else that comes in the room as well. Here's my contact information if you want to reach out to me. I am at Girl Conductor on all social media platforms. Um, you can email me at info at girlconductor.com. I also host a radio show called Bach and Beyonce. That's Thursday nights at 8 p.m. I hope, um, God, 35 minutes is not long enough, but I hope you all got something out of this presentation. And I hope that I inspired you to just think outside the box and remix it everything changed remember everything changed last year so if the world can change then we definitely can change how we are doing choir thank you so much acda i appreciate it oh thank you so much maria thanks to both franklin and maria for their insightful presentations today and we are going to do a, a little bit more chatting here. Um, I thought of a couple of things as they were presenting, and I know Sundra put a question in the, the chat, but I'm going to ask them here in just a few minutes. Um, and then if you do have questions, we may not have time for all of them. Um, but once again, you can go on the Facebook live page or the Facebook page on ACDA and type in some questions even after that is over with. But before we entertain any questions and before I ask um, what the question that Sundra put into the chat, um, Sundra is going to put up a Zoom survey. She's going to put up a poll and we request your participation. There it is right now. You can see it on your screen. 
And anyone can fill out this survey, but it is required for those of you wishing to receive professional development credit for tonight's session. So you must fill this out if you are requesting professional development uh, credit for this. But anyone is welcome to fill it out, but be sure that if you want professional development credit that, um, that you do that. Um, I just see in the chat that someone said, Sundra, that the form disappeared. So Sundra, I'm still seeing it on my end on my screen, um, but I, I am seeing Sundra from a few folks that the, the form disappeared and they're having some trouble seeing it. Sundra, are you seeing those? I am seeing the chat, but I'm not seeing, I'm seeing it on my screen. I'm not sure what to do. I'm not an expert on. Uh... I see the poll on my screen also as well. Let me, um, does switching it into gallery view help? I don't know. Like I said, I'm seeing it, so I'm not going to be very good as far as giving uh, feedback on that because I am actually seeing it. Sandra, it says the poll has ended. Uh, oh, looks like it might be. So the issue is if I relaunch it, it's going to erase the... It's working. It's okay. working. working now. I'm, I'm seeing yeah. it. It looks that way anyway. I'm seeing stuff coming in, so... If um, I'm going to put my email in the chat, and if you can't see the poll, but you need to complete it, please just email me and say, hey, I was here. Hey, so I'll give you a couple of seconds to respond to that, especially since we had a little glitch right there. Um, so please, once again, everyone is welcome to fill it out. But please, if you do want professional development credit again, in order to receive that credit, you will need to fill out the poll. Okay, um, Franklin and Maria, this is for both of you while folks are, are filling that out. Um, I am gonna ask a question that Sandra actually put in the chat and um, I'll just ask it to each of you. Uh, what are the takeaways during this crazy year with COVID? And Maria, you talked a little bit about this in your presentation. What what is, what takeaways do you have that you're going to you are going to keep? You know, you were just like, well, you know, I did this differently during this time of COVID, and you know what? I think I'm going to keep this. And uh, so, Franklin, if if you want to answer that first, just for a couple of minutes, and then we'll we'll go to Maria. So, in this crazy time of COVID, what are some takeaways that you were just like, you know what? I did this. This was different but I am going to keep this. So Franklin, what do you, do you have something on your mind? Yes. Um, number one is just um, sharing with other music teachers. I feel like it exploded through, you know, last year when we went to virtual teaching and more teachers were online, more teachers were hopping in on Instagram and Facebook, sharing what was working for them. Um, so I'm going to continue to look for resources that other teachers are creating. Sometimes we get in this um, mindset that it has to be from a certain publisher or it has to have, you know, uh, I'm trying to be politically correct. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that teachers can create great things too, right? You don't have to uh, go through this process right you used it with your students you saw that it worked you put it out online and then other people were able to say wait a minute i could use that with my kids too that's one i'm going to continue doing that and then two giving students the opportunity for a, a virtual like rehearsal like i think that was really really key of you know it it, it it's a lot to set up on the front end but on the set on the back end you have tons of footage you have tons of things that you can say hey go back and look at video two when we were going through you know the b section of this piece and that is a living breathing like piece of content that students can go back and rehearse like i just think that that is so awesome and then you don't have to be in the space in order to receive the the instruction 
So those are the two things for me that I'm taking with me moving forward. Yeah. De I definitely agree. Maria, do you have something that you want to share that that's a keeper? Yes. Um, <laughs> frankly, get out of my head, first of all. But yes, there there are. I love the the Zoom thing. Like Zoom is now a thing in my rehearsal um, that kids, if you have to miss or you're somewhere else, you can still get on and be in rehearsal. And that way I can still hold you accountable for what happened during rehearsal. So we were uh, recording every rehearsal so that kids can log on if they need to, or, you know, if something happened and you had to miss this week, you could still be a part of rehearsal. So that's, that's one thing I'm keeping. The other thing I'm keeping is I have, um, I don't know. I feel like some weeks I'm running like the Maria show during my rehearsals and I absolutely love it. Like I am um, coming up with all kinds of creative ways. Like I'm just thinking more and more out the box, how I can remix my rehearsal. So, um, one day I may show up in a crazy wig and, and, and maybe we, we read a story from this book where the lady had on a crazy wig, you know what I'm saying? So I'm just finding all these different ways that I can connect with the students. Franklin brought up a good point about, um, us being able to, see what other teachers are doing online. And let me tell you, I think that is one of the biggest free resources that's out there. If Franklin does something with his kids, with his rhythm sticks or something, I'm like, okay, bet Franklin, I'm still in that. Let me give you a little credit, stole this from Franklin, but then I'm going to use that with my kids. So Franklin put up a, a, a exercise. I think this was still over the summer when he had these, these rhythms with, he did the song, Walk It Out, the little hip hop song, Walk It Out. And he gave these various rhythms. And I was like, bet Franklin, I can do that. So when my kids was back in person, I was like, all right, y'all, we got these rhythms, we walking it out. But I got that from Franklin. So there's so many people online sharing um, what they're doing in the classroom. And I figured if you share it, then you want me to use it. So I have no problem giving you credit and then go ahead and use that um, as a resource for my students as well. <laughs> yes. I, and, you know, I think being able to to see what other teachers are doing and I agree, too, and is on the university level now, you know, Zoom, I think, is here to stay with us on the university level. Definitely, uh, whether in rehearsals or in in regular classroom sessions. Um, and you talk about, you know, borrowing from other teachers. Um, those of you who are on the call that might know who uh, Guy Webb was, who we who we just lost recently, I absolutely adored Guy and um, my madrigal dinners years ago. Um, I formatted some of them after some elements that he used to do on the university level. And I remember one time showing him the, the program and talking to him. And he says, well, you know, my middle initial is B for borrow. So we gain so much and learn so much just from um, sharing and being able to see what other people are doing and uh, being able to bring that into our classroom. Um, one of the questions that came up in the chat and Franklin and Maria, this is, this is for both of you. It was, it was uh, Franklin basically aimed to you, but I think you both can address it because you both talked about gospel music in your presentations and yeah. So the question was basically also dealing with gospel music and religious aspects. And I know for me, um, presenting gospel music, you know, that that is also historical and cultural. And we deal with it also from that standpoint in the classroom. And so there is absolutely no issues with presenting gospel music in the classroom. Um, but they would, uh, but this particular question came up about how perhaps you deal with um, some of those issues as they come up in your classroom. Um, so Franklin, uh, since it was addressed to you, I'm gonna let you go first, but then Maria, I'd like for you to weigh in also as well. Well, you hit it already. You answered the question about with the historical um, cultural context. That's how I've, I've taught it and how I introduce it um to parents i'm not trying to convert anybody to any religion um i'm sharing an art form um the the meaning of gospel music is good news and so um that is the the way i've taught it and um i have had some students who um they opt out to to perform those songs 
Um, and even with patriotic tunes, like even My Country Tis of Thee, um, Star Spangled Banner, I've had parents who uh, they don't want their children singing those particular songs. And so I always try to get ahead of it by sharing with teachers, with uh, the community, hey, if I'm doing a hip hop unit, we're gonna be doing hip hop. This is what I'm gonna be teaching. These are the songs. And usually when you give parents a heads up, you will find out you know, who um, has questions, what songs are you teaching, what's the context, and also that it is a music standard, right? Um, many times students are singing, uh, joy to the world, the Lord is, huh? And that has religious context to it as well. So sometimes it's just explaining because some folks just are ignorant to the music um or or singing any cultural music it's having the the context and providing that in such a way that parents can understand it and receive it and then ultimately make a decision on that and i honor that if a student does not want to or a parent does not want that i honor that in my classroom maria do you have anything to add to that yes so sometimes with gospel I may sing a regular song and I may just put it in a gospel style because I still need you to understand this style of music. If, and I'm going to talk about me, my background is gospel. If I have to learn Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, then surely you can learn Kirk Franklin, Fred Hammond, Walter Hawkins, and all those kind of people. Because my parents couldn't opt out and say, I don't want her to sing the Bach piece. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do that. That's just what we had to sing at the time. So I don't pick up. I don't pick music that's like um, blood wash redeemer, Jesus heavy. I may not pick that, but um, Rallo Dilworth has a song about joy in my heart that has that's in a gospel style. Um, I sing because I'm happy. Again, gospel style. Or sometimes I may just sing like the Itsy Bitsy Spider, and I may put that in a gospel style because I just need you to understand these various styles of music that's not to say we're going to perform the Issy Bissy Spider the gospel version in a concert but throughout the out my rehearsals you're getting all of these various genres of music I feel like as teachers when we don't teach certain styles of music we're not giving our students a full well-rounded music education and it is my job as your teacher to educate um, the math teacher uh, does not can't, can't say, you know what, I'm not teaching area and perimeter today. I'm not teaching that because I got a letter from somebody that says their kids don't need to know that. No, the math teacher has to teach all of math. And as music teachers, we have to teach all of music. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I agree 100%. Um, another question that came through uh, is, and also this is for both of you, since you both talked about online teaching. Um, Franklin, it was asked to you first, um, specifically, okay. but like I said, I think both of you can weigh in on this. Um, just talking about online rehearsal tips that you might have when constructing an online rehearsal. And then also any suggestions you have, such as particular apps that you might use or tools that you might use in addition to, you know, just the obvious platform. So online rehearsal tips, and then any types of additional apps or any types of additional um, things you might use in addition to the platform. So Franklin, since once again, it was addressed to you first, I'll, I'll let you begin. And then Maria, if you would also weigh in, I think that would be fabulous. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling really, really <laughs> put on the spot. But, um, but what I will say is I have um, taught online. I have not ran many rehearsals online, but there is a resource by Michelle um, Rose um, with F Flat Books. It's a whole book about, um, it's an ebook about teaching online, apps, uh, ideas for lessons, how to go through your rehearsal. Um, but one of the apps that I do love is Flipgrid. And I use Flipgrid before the pandemic and even now um, for students to submit video recordings. It's such a great platform. Um, they can do it right from their phone. Um, they can talk to you. They can give, a, you can, I mean, it's just a lovely, it's, it's free. Um, and that's Flipgrid. 
Um, we did Microsoft Teams in my district, so um, I am a Zoom fan, but Teams uh, is tough. So I'll be asking you all for the tips on online rehearsals. I'm gonna pass it to Maria. <laughs> So I have taught online rehearsal last last um, last year. My choir, my children's choir, was the virtual choir, and one thing. And I also ran a virtual summer camp for elementary kids. So the one thing that I found number one was that I had to plan and plan and plan some more with my rehearsals because to me that was like having my own little TV show. And I can never let that rehearsal be stale because they have options. When you're at home, your dog can come by and distract you. Your mama can come in your room and say something to you. So I got to find ways to keep the kids engaged. So I had lots of brain break activities, lots of get up and move activities, lots of, hey, go run around the house, go find something red, bring it back to me. Like those type of activities. I did all those things to keep them engaged. When it came time for singing, I would have everybody mute so I could check parts and I would listen to the kids sing one at a time. So of course you all know we can't sing on Zoom all together, but I could check parts by having you sing right now. Okay, let me check that, awesome. Or um, I would have, I had an assistant at the time, she would pull a kid out of the actual Zoom meeting and we would listen to that kid separately and correct whatever singing things they may have had. And then I would just teach, you know, I have, if you can see, I have my piano right here to use my piano and just teach the different parts that way. Um, I actually enjoyed teaching elementary choir on Zoom. Uh, I do not have kind words to say about Microsoft Teams um, because I didn't, I don't, I just, I don't like it. I just don't, I don't like, maybe, and maybe it's because I'm not used to it. So it's not my favorite, but with Zoom, at least you can show your screen. You can add some videos, you can add other scenes and stuff to make your rehearsal more fun. I like to think of last year as though we were having our, we all had our own little Blues Clues special. And as Blues Clues and Sesame Street, how they keep it moving, that was the pace of my rehearsal. I had to keep it moving. Yes, and I agree. And I have to, I have to chime in and say I'm with you with between the Zoom and the Teams. Um, <laughs> We've started using teams at, at the university and I hope there's no one here who maybe has relatives who work for Microsoft. It has nothing to do with that. Um, but, you know, uh, Zoom has, once you got it figured out, I was like, okay, this can be pretty user-friendly. And then we started using teams and I was like, why? Why do we need 10 different mm -hmm. things to do the same thing we've been doing successfully now? Um, and I agree too that the challenges with also doing the online rehearsals, um, you know, I did several uh, out of state honor choirs, which a, the plus side is, of course, I'm not having to travel. So, you know, that was, that was a great thing. People are just saying, oh, can you do this for us, et cetera. But one of the challenges with that is you do, when you're looking at the literature, especially it's like, okay, how am I going to do this? Because of course the one drawback is not being able to hear that sound in real time coming back at you. And it's like, okay, everyone's going to be muted. And so I'm looking at their faces and how are we going to, to, you know, really work this music? How are we going to go through this process? And so it does take a different type of mindset and a different type of planning. But at the same time, too, um, there are so many things that are beneficial by being able to do that as well. Because, you know, I would also say things like, look at everyone else on the screen. Now, can you make your mouths all look exactly the same? And you know, that those are things that you can't do even in a live rehearsal. Well, you can tell them to turn, but they can actually look and see everyone's mouths and those vowels. You can't hear it because everyone's muted. But there are so many things that are still very beneficial through doing those those online rehearsals and the online platforms. Um, I also saw a, a question in the chat. Um, and I know that there was a question in here about knowing more, Franklin, about your hip hop unit. But I, for the sake of time, because there's another question in here as well, um, 
I would just tell those those folks, you know, if you're not familiar with Franklin's hip hop curriculum, please visit his website, his information, and then you can contact him directly. And I am sure he will uh, would love to chat with you about that. Um, and that also in the state of Tennessee, um, our state president for TMEA, Alexis Derryberry, um, she also gave a hip hop curriculum um, presentation at National NAFME several years ago. Um, and so there's there's a lot going on in that area. So, but I would recommend that you go to Franklin's website and, and contact him directly. Um, the last question I think we'll have time for before we do like a little bit of a wrap up is, and once again, this is for both of you, uh, what have you found to be the hardest thing about transitioning back to in-person teaching from a year of online learning? So what's the hardest thing that you found about making that transition back? So uh, Maria, I'm gonna let you start with this one first. Thank you. It's the, uh, the singing in the mask. Um, that because because I was not used to singing in a mask because I was at home, just how difficult it is to sing in a mask and to hear the students and to constantly remind them, if you sing at level two, I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. So do not pull your mask down and sing for me, but I need you to, to bump that volume up so I can hear you. So that's the hardest thing. And then finding the right mask that is not sucking into, you know, almost taking your breath away every time you breathe. That has been one of the hardest things that I've found. Also, um, really understanding where the students are. Because when we left in 2020, you know, they may have been at level, let's say level seven, but now after a year and a half of not singing for some of them, you know, it's, we back to, for some of them, we back at like basics. So me saying, okay, Maria, um, if your choir is not at this level, it's okay. And that does not mean that you are a bad teacher or that you don't know what you're doing. We are in a whole pandemic. <laughs> we still in it. And so having mm -hmm. that grace for myself, being graceful with myself and saying, Maria, it's okay. Meet them where they are and just go back and teach. If they don't have it, hey, that's all right. I'm teaching you from where you are and eventually we'll get back to where we need to be. And I'm, I'm okay with that. So those are some of the hardest things that I've dealt with. Franklin, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, she, she a brilliant, I mean, uh, response, um, the assessment piece, just being able to figure out, okay, this is my fourth grade class, but we we're not able to read these 16th notes. They're looking at me like, what is that? Right. And so just being, um, free and open and flexible with your instruction to be able to say, hey, it's okay. Fourth grade, they don't have the 16th notes. Let's start back with what they do have. And so um, in my role as a coach, instructional coach, I get to go into so many different classes. And so throughout the district, I may see one fourth grade class that is soaring and taking off and doing all types of stuff. And then see another fourth grade class that is like, wait a minute, what's going on? So um, it, it's, I think it's redefining what success is for you mm -hmm. and understanding that my success is going to look different than Maria's success. My babies, they, this is what they can do and celebrating what they can do and then taking them from there and, and, and bumping them up, you know, and then adding that rigor, adding the additional extensions of the activities. But I, I see it so often with my kids, they can't, they can't, they can't do this. Focus on what they can do. And then you will be able to build and add on all of those other elements that you're trying to teach. Yes, I, and I agree wholeheartedly, you know, I mean, because we see that on the university level also as well. And two, I, I would say added to that with the singing, also teacher fatigue with the masks on all the time. I know I get... I get pretty hot. My I get hot enough. My hair, my bangs start to curl, you know, from <laughs> from the humidity created from my own mm -hmm. hot air. So, you know, I mean, it's I, I think that 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 is a real challenge and, and the singing. And um, and I I think you are both correct to Maria, as you said, we're still in it. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. 
Um, but you know, but we're, we're back and doing live performances with our masks and, and we will continue to make music. Um, but so many things I appreciated that both of you said tonight. And, and I know Maria said, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't look at each other's notes, but I knew, I knew when I had asked both of these, uh, wonderful individuals that they were going to compliment one another. And I feel like that your presentations were so complimentary and uh, also so many uh, wonderful tidbits. Um, I, you know, wholeheartedly agree with Franklin that if you have not seen the Rita Pearson, Every Kid Needs a Champion, you need to see it. I show that every single um, semester to my introduction to music education students. And then I will say, why did I show that to you? Because it's about the relationships. It is about the relationships and how do you want to be remembered? And it's too late to think about that years down the road. You have to think about that whenever you're starting out. Um, and so I, I think that is so, so important. And Maria, talking about singing to your students made me think about um, back when I was teaching middle school and high school, and I would sing um, I Will Always Love You, the uh, Whitney Houston version, not the, the Dolly Parton, even though Dolly Parton, of course, we as we know is the composer. But uh, and that also actually got me out of a speeding ticket one night. I would happen to be speeding, go a little too fast. And I was coming from choir practice and the officer said, so, so where are you coming from? And I said, choir practice. He said, okay, let's hear it. So I broke into it and he was like, all right, all right, you can sing. I get it. <laughs> and no, he did not give me a ticket. Uh, so, but those, there's just so many little tidbits in there. And Franklin, I have been saying the same thing about knowing people's names. If you want to change the world, just know a person's name and say it correctly and really take the time to do that. Um, you know, my name has been slaughtered more times than, you know, you can imagine. Um, and of course, and it is just for the record, everyone, it is Jamila. And so it's Jamila. And then of course, you know, McCorder is, is not a piece of cake either, but Jamila is, is the first name. And so it does, it gets that every once in a while, but knowing our students and know that we see them and know that we recognize them. And everybody used to, you know, we used to try to shorten names and things like that. And Maria, I'm with you rather than, you know, Mariah or Marie or, you know, so, but I think it's really important that our, our students know that. So we have basically come to the end of our time. Um, thanks again so much to Franklin Willis and Maria Ellis um, for sharing their insights and inspiration this evening. Um, once again, this webinar was recorded and it will be available on the ACDA website as well as the handouts the presenters wish uh, to share with you. Um, so also, if you are on Facebook Live, once again, the presenters will answer questions on the Facebook Live page over the next few days, though, uh, and as they have time to field questions as questions come up. Um, continue to watch for more webinars from the ACDA Education and Communication uh, National Standing Committee. Um, the next one we hope to present, uh, we hope to present one entitled Teaching Voice in the Choral Setting. Um, so that should be coming up in 2022. So be on the lookout for that. So uh, once again, Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much to our wonderful clinicians. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much and have a wonderful night.